I was asked to discuss the questions uh, that might be answerable. And um, the one thing I guess, I'll do two things I'll say before I launch into this. One is that uh, a number of the questions have been here today about, is it envisioned that X, Y, or Z? And I can tell you from at least my experience of being on the planning group that this is not one of those cases where someone thinks they have the answer and you're trying to read the tea leaves and pull out of them what they already have decided. This is a case where there's a problem and we need to solve it. And the other thing I would say about that is that the genomics community has done a very good job over the years, I would argue, of saying what problem needs to be solved and then going out and solving it even when the answer was not in sight as opposed to saying what's possible. But sometimes when these types of issues come up, we say what's possible. And I think that obviously we're going to adhere to every, every rule and regulation and, and uh, commitment we've made, but we should be thinking outside the box. So what I thought I would do in, in thinking about this, which is not a standard talk, is actually try and address not only the, what are the questions, but who are the audiences? Who are the communities we're trying to serve? And I think the reason that's important is that this tends to be a discussion, I think, of us talking about how we serve ourselves. And I'm going to try and, at least those of us who are members of the genomics community, and I'm going to try and, and de, uh, at least destabilize that. So what I mean is, some of us are gene hunters. I guess it would be fair to put me in that category and say, you know, I have a disease I'm interested in, and I want to, and it varies in the population, it's heritable, and so I desire DNA sequence data, and I want to compare it to controls, and my success is measured as, like, do I find a gene? Okay, that's a valid activity. And another, and, and, and you could argue that, over the last few years, we've made some progress, because it used to be this was done in an incredibly fragmented way with everyone's attempts to study disease X done separately. And we've done a good job of pulling it together in terms of each disease. So you do see papers where, in, in effect, however it was done, however elegantly or inelegantly, we look across all the, a lot of available studies. But actually, we seldom or almost never make that data available to other people studying other diseases and traits. Statistical geneticists, I'm going to go through five different categories of human being. Um, statistical geneticists tend to develop analytical and computational methods to analyze genetic variation for a variety of good purposes, and they desire access to data so they can develop and test and apply their methods. And their success is measured as, is my method good? Did I, they often talk about, did I explain the variance? Because explaining variance is a lot of what statistics can be about. And they, and they publish papers. And again, um, you could say the dbGaP has provided some route to access for th that community of people to apply their methods to data, but it's certainly cumbersome. And in particular, um, each time you have a new question or you have a new data set, you have to go back and get a new data use. And actually, so it's not very flexible. It's not nimble, but it does exist. Nonetheless, I would argue that while some attention and effort should be dedicated to the communities of which many of us are members, it should not be our main focus here for the next two days, because that's actually how we serve ourselves. And I actually think we're doing a much better job of serving ourselves than actually we are of serving the 90% or whatever of the biomedical research community who are potentially to be informed. If we're ever going to deliver on the promise that we all say we're going to inform biology and medicine, then we have to actually have some impact on biology and medicine. And I think that we're not doing that very much, I would argue. And it's because we're not actually answering the questions those people have in a language that they understand. So I'm going to just sort of at the risk of, I'm like way out there, right, because I'm vastly oversimplifying, but nonetheless to be provocative. So I trained as a biologist. I didn't train as a geneticist or a statistician or an epidemiologist. I trained as a doctor and a biologist. And what most biologists, I would say, my department do, is they study a process, and they in particular study a gene, or they study a pathway. They don't actually want much from human geneticists, except that we don't consume too much of the NIH budget. But to the extent that they could care at all about what we do, their question is, I have a gene or pathway that I study. Does human genetics in any way, I could be, I could be flip and say, does it in any way confirm what I already know to be true, and if not, I don't really want to hear about it. But one way or another, they want to connect their gene to human biology. So I would ask you the question, if you were such a biologist and you didn't know what you knew, how would you possibly answer that question? That's the phone call we get a lot, actually. So I'm less concerned about the phone call of the statistician who says, where can I get more data sets than the biologist who says, which I hear all the time, because I work more in a community of biologists, and they say, well, I study this gene, and you know, I study the mouse model of X. Is that true in the human genetics? And you have to like, go get a, if you wanted to, you might get a postdoc who could spend the next month and a half trying to cull through all the literature to write a review article for them. But there's certainly no simple answer that we have offered yet to that question. Let's think about doctors for a second. I'm one of those, too. So at least I was once. I'm defrocked. But if you, if you have a patient in front of you, your question is, and there are people in the room here who are currently and, and very uh, leading uh, uh, in, this, in this domain, but you know, a patient comes in and there's some question about predicting the course of their disease, diagnosing the, the cause of their disease, recommending some intervention. 
And increasingly, we hear about the idea that we're going to have genome sequences in the clinic. So if you had a genome sequence of a patient and, uh, you know, and, and, and you wanted to know how would I even annotate this with regard to the world's current knowledge of, bio, of sort of relationships between DNA variants and disease or even just frequencies, has this variant been seen before, right? You need access to the world's data in a form other than, again, go read 100 papers and try and summarize for yourself what's going on. And many of the efforts I hear of to do this are like hand curation, that we're going to think about individuals going and doing this. And, and that's important and necessary, but it's sure nice to be able to provide, especially if we imagine going from what we have today to 50,000 to a million genomes, some sort of at least summary of what's been seen to date that those expert committees could work on. I also just to sort of gratuitously want to note the uh, concern about ascertainment bias. I'm very concerned that uh, a lot of Mendelian so-called mutations have only been studied in people with Mendelian phenotypes, and that, you know, if you wanted to, if your patient came in and had an incidental finding, so they didn't actually walk in with a leg growing out of their head, and you found the gene mutation associated with the leg growing out of their head, it's not surprising they don't have a leg growing out of their head, unless you are such a Mendelian that you believe that all mutations are fully penetrant. But that's the danger we're in right now. And so in some sense, the potential of of all these genome sequences we have is to provide a rich, you know, data set in which to say, well, in people not selected for having a leg growing out of your head, that's actually Drosophila, not humans, but if you're people not with that phenotype, did you ever see this mutation and was there a phenotype so that you could say your patient who didn't have the phenotype walking in the door to the Mendelian Genetics Clinic, you know, what's to be expected? And we don't have that right now, okay? And then finally, and, and I'm going to be followed by uh, Jeff Trimmer, who's going to talk with much more authority about this. But my sense of what most people in the pharmaceutical industry think about is developing therapeutics that might actually help patients. That's their job. And to the extent human genetics is relevant, it's either because it could help you predict in advance what the effect would be of modulating a target with a drug, because there might be a genetic perturbation in it, or maybe selecting patients for inclusion in a trial. Their success is not p-values and statistics and papers. It's a drug that works. And again, if you worked in a pharmaceutical industry and you were not a statistical geneticist, how would you answer the question, like if you're working on a drug target and you're going to inhibit it and you want to say, does any experiment of nature inform to me what might happen in the patient, where would you go to look? Because the answer is our community has failed to deliver something with that sort of simple level of clarity that might inform that activity. And so I think that um, this is actually, you know, the, the, we should, as we think in our usual genomics community way as to how to realize the impossible, you know, because like a thousand dollar genome just five years ago, how likely was that? Or sequencing the human genome in the first place or any of these things, actually just organizing ourselves to answer whatever questions that turn out to be the most important should be more achievable than going from, you know, a hundred million dollars to sequence a genome to a thousand dollars in a space of some number of years. So we should be able to tackle this. So just to close, I'm, and then we can have discussion, you know, what are some of the kinds of questions? And again, this is just an individual view. This is my point of view. I'm not saying these are the right questions. I'm just trying to provoke some discussion. Things like, you know, given a phenotype of interest, we should make it very easy. And some of this is like OMIM, right? Some of this is what used to exist for OMIM. It's just a OMIM in the world where it's actually there's, you know, a million genome sequences and it all could be integrated. But it's questions like, given a phenotype of interest, identify the complete collection of genes and mutations that have the property that genetic variation is associated with your disease of interest. So you should be able to go somewhere and ask a question, show me all the genes. I study heart attack, or I'm a medical student thinking about what I want to do with my life, and I really care about heart attack, and I like human genetics, so could someone please tell me what are the genes that are actually involved in heart attack? And I don't want, like, a committee writing a summary article. I'd actually like to see some analysis of data. Given a gene of interest, flipping it around or orthogonally, what are the set of phenotypes that have been associated with this gene? So, you know, this could be like a drug company saying, we're developing drugs that target endothelial ly lipase. Are there any, you know, we want to do that because it might affect HDL. Are there any, you know, phenotypic associations of mutations in that? Another thing would be we have a variant now. We've gotten from the gene to the variant because they won't always be the same. You know, CDCAL1 and intron and CDCAL1 is associated both with uh, Crohn's disease and also with type 2 diabetes, it turns out not to be the same genetic variation, although they're right next to each other. It's different haplotypes. So you might want to know if it's the same variant or not. And here you might want to say, there's a variant in my gene I found, you know, uh, that is associated with HDL, and, you know, I'm doing that because I want to actually affect heart attack, so is that same variant associated with heart attack? 
So some of you may have seen St. Kath Reeson and, and a cast of, uh, of, of international collaboration actually published this, this paper, of which I, I'm an author, that came out a couple of weeks ago that said, let's look at variants associated with HDL cholesterol and their risk of heart attack. And so the answer to the first question might be here across some of the premier epi cohorts in the world are the effects of this variant on, L on HDL. And here in 116,000 people is the utter lack of any effect of that variant on heart attack. But why is this not a lookup? Like, why does this have to be the case that every time someone, because there's a lot of other questions like this, why is it that each one of them has to be a year and a half long effort and we start from scratch every time? This is a phenotype genotype matrix. In theory, it should be possible to simply have the data available so someone could walk up and say, hmm, I'd like to take all the variants associated with glucose and ask if they affect heart attack risk. Or, oh, I'd like to take all the, you know, the, I believe in the inflammatory hypothesis of type 2 diabetes. There are a lot of variants that are associated with inflammatory diseases. Do they have any effect on type 2 diabetes? I'd like to note, just so it's not, um, unstated, this will change the workforce that we need because many of these things are what people might imagine a crew of hundreds of people writing papers about for the next however many years, but that's good. All right, first of all, progress is good. There will, you know, if it's good that it costs less to sequence genomes, it should be our goal to figure out how to automate analysis, but also it won't actually put us out of work any more than sequencing the human genome put people out of work because what we'll do is generate a, high, a large number of high quality hypotheses that then could be the subject of future study and future genetic analysis. And so I'm just going to close by saying, you know, to my mind, the question is, how do we take what is the incredible amount of money that the society has invested in us to sequence the genome, to perform all these clinical studies, to perform genetic studies, to sequence all these genomes, and deliver answers that are not just, not just think about how do we get more access to data so our lives are easier, we have less bureaucracy, and we have less difficulty getting high-powered things to write our papers, but how do we actually answer questions that the rest of the biomedical community really, really needs and, and think more about that, perhaps. And the other thing I want to be clear on is this is obviously incredibly complex, okay? So I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to put out what I was asked to, what are some of the questions? But it obviously calls for organizational and cultural change. It calls for some regulatory change. Again, I don't think our goal coming out of this meeting should be to find the solution. That would be a huge mistake, right? Even if we worked, you know, weren't let out of the room until we'd spent a week here, you know, and came away with our consensus view of what to do, I'm sure it wouldn't be nearly as good as actually some period of years in which there was a lot of innovation and diversity of approaches in trying to answer the questions. So as much as budgets are tight, we have invested a huge amount in getting this far. And what we should try and think of is actually doing some experiments in how this could work, because over time, I'm sure then this community will converge you know, over time on maybe not one solution, maybe multiple solutions, maybe different solutions for different kinds of questions or different audiences. It might be there's one kind of audience to enable the invest, one kind of approach maybe to investigate the sophisticated computational analyst to have access to data, and it might not be the same as the one for the biologist or the pharmaceutical investigator who has a different set of questions, or maybe it is the same, I don't know. But let's not try and come up with a consensus opinion, but rather come up with some approach that will begin to make these things possible. So with that, uh, there's some time for discussion. Hopefully that will provoke some. Yes, Lincoln. Yeah, I think you missed one audience uh, type, and yes. that would be the researcher trying to organize a study and looking for suitable patients. Mm. Say, go yes. to a database, find all patients with high cholesterol and a relatively rare mutation and pull out 5,000 people Absolutely. that can be recontacted and recruited. So David Cox and I were just talking about that before the meeting, and I think that uh, as I totally agree with that. I think that we, as long as we are, and I think we are being flexible, as we don't conflate the idea that we do need to do that and do need to pull in new patients based on a genotype or a phenotype with all the retrospective data. Because uh, if we say that those have to be the same thing, and this did happen early in this discussion, it, the whole discussion became hung up on like solving every problem with every patient. You know, all data should be in and all data should be called backable. And so I think you're absolutely right. There should be a, you want to design a study and you'd like to pull people in based on some combination of genotype and phenotype. And such a system would certainly help you formulate those hypotheses. And if there were some genotyped individuals or phenotyped individuals who were re consented for recontact, it could be obviously a direct, you know, sort of suggestion of what the next steps were. Eric. So David, building off of that and also combining your talk with Adams, it'd be interesting to know how many in his histograms he showed, how many of those individuals are, are measured for many, many, many traits yes. and are currently being followed so as they develop new diseases those or new conditions, those conditions could be entered into this database. So the wealth of information would continue to grow yep. as opposed to static 
case control studies, yep. they're important, but I, I think they don't have the value that these deeply phenotyped yeah. studies would have. So I would agree, and the only other comment I would add to that is, I think they're particularly of value. In my mind, case control studies have always been an efficient way to generate hypotheses, and longitudinal uh, 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 population-based studies are a great way to characterize the effects and follow over time. And to the extent we had them in one analysis environment, then that leap would be very easy. You know, if you wanted to ask, is the effect different or the same, or look at other phenotypes? And so I, I don't think they're in conflict. You'd probably want them both accessible. But I agree with you that samples you might want to invest more in would be those where you're going to keep a gift that keeps giving. Uh, Carlos? And so, then, David, do you think it would be useful to think about, in terms of the set of questions that you asked, you know, what are the set of things that we believe we could achieve, you know, that 50% of the way there in, in a year, right? Like open up all the big studies in a way that would make it really easy for analysts to barrage on the data. Uh, and then what are the sort of the, mid, the medium term versus the long term goals? And, you know, as the, you know, in thinking about, I think you made a very articulate argument about the role of, you know, industry that could come in here, right? I mean, you are talking about creating new sectors of the economy that, that are going to be enrolled in how this information and data is going to be managed. So, so I don't want to, I mean, again, I'll just give my own opinion. It may not be, I'm being intentionally a little uh, uh, iconoclastic or whatever in terms of how our community thinks. I think it's harder, but I might, I might get pushed back in this. I might well be wrong. If you, if you say, and I'll, I don't want to quote you, but you know, if we say, how are we going to get it so every analyst can go, I think you actually had barrage on the data, but you know, can have free access to the data. That to me is actually a fairly complicated task because there's a whole set of issues about what are they going to do with it, how are you going to act, control it, how are you going to regulate it, all of which need to be addressed. I think in the long run, we will get the best answers from having a diversity of approaches going to work. Something that, that it, having a limited number of approaches applied to a large number of data would actually be easier to achieve, you know what I'm saying, than it would be to have, take all the data and make it accessible to everyone for everything. So as we think about quick wins, and I'm, you know, the question of whether our initial goal should be achieving so all the analysts can do their analysis, which in particular the analysts will be enthusiastic about, you know, versus what are a set of questions that we need answers to across data sets, and can we pi pilot how we get those answers so we can learn what things are needed? They're not in conflict. It's just they have, they're different challenges. Uh, there was a comment over here. And then yeah, I just wanted to comment about the recontact based on genotype. I think even that one has to think about governance. If you take BRCA1 and 2 as an example, there have been dozens of studies, and many centers have really found you have to limit the number of times yes. you recontact people with the latest hot genotype. So I think even that we'd have to think about the governance. I totally agree, and I actually think that's so clearly correct that while recontact as, as Lincoln was saying, is a very important thing to enable. I personally would hold it as a separate goal because it raises so many different issues than just bringing the data together and doing certain kinds of analyses that we shouldn't ignore it, we should focus on it, but we shouldn't think one size fits all. Pearl, did you want to add something to that? Yeah, on that same uh, note, I think uh, sitting here listening to data access versus access for recontact are so wildly different. They both have their place, but I think if we're looking for a 50% solution, I think the recontact deserves another yeah. meeting. So we might actually say, actually there's three levels of, of, that we're actually talking about in my mind. There's actually access to results, then there's access to data, and then there's access to the patients who gave the samples to generate the results and the data. And again, we should just keep them separate. I think Arvindu was next. Um, you know, in, in hearing you and a number of other people speak and comment, you know, one thing that uh, this is likely to very effectively lead to is to know uh, not only this question of studying health disparities, but where the disparities are in the studies, meaning we don't even know across all of human morbidity as to what we are studying. I'm not saying we should make it proportional to, you know, mortality and all of that, but, but just where the gaps are yep. is currently very, very difficult to know. Um, yeah. And this is particularly true for studies in children as to who are being studied for what and how. And this might be very, very important in trying to figure out where yeah. the holes, at least the big holes are. That's right. I, I think a couple of things we might keep, keep uh, they're important, but we, I'm just hearing some of the threads that we might keep separate in our minds even as we attend to all of them. 
One is how do we create a computational, regulatory, organizational environment in which such things could be, certain things could be done. It would be a different environment for different such things. Then there's what you guys are both raising is what data has gone into that database. And this, the meeting last week that Francis and Michael Dulce and other organizers, a lot of discussion of what would you want, in my mind, it was described as in a different way, but it's really like what samples would you want in such a database in order to ensure that you found the most important things, but you still would want in the database, you could look as what Eric's saying, you know, if you found something, you'd like to then look at the studies of Lanshul, and you guys are saying, maybe you wouldn't have the right ethnic or ancestry mix. So there's a, an organizational and software platform that's secure and responsive to enable things. There's what's in it, and then there's how we serve the answers, including answers like that you would or would not be allowed to recontact someone. Yes. Yes, speaking about communities that you might not have included, the patient community might be one exactly for the reasons of perhaps not needing to recontact if they donate up front. And then also that they donate a phenotype that is progressing over time. Because you don't want a snapshot only, you want to know what happened 10 years from now. So, so that model, since you are in the business of breaking yes. uh, the, the, the establishment, I think it would be very important. I think, I think you're right. I think that there, there's an even fuller view of what we're talking about where the patients could have, if I'm hearing you correctly, and you know, patient involvement in an ongoing way. Is that is this what you're Well, I think people are legitimately yes. out there trying to donate blood, donating data, donating what they can to, to uh, make health better. Yes. And, and that by itself would remove a lot of the barriers that we have right now. So again, I'm, I totally, I personally resonate very much with what you're saying, and I think again, as we we might want to keep track of what are the different threads, because you know a system that could allow you to do such things would be powerfully used in this in the social environment you're describing, where patients are engaged in an ongoing way contributing. It, but at the same time, the system would be useful even without that, and you know we want to keep each of them separate threads, uh, but because they're each important and they each have separate solutions. Yeah, and I think computationally we can. Uh, put data out there, but allow permissions at different levels. Yes. All right. Um, I assume somebody is in charge of the time. I am watching how long I've been up here. I've not, there's more time. But yeah, Gonzalo? I had a, a few comments to throw out. So I think when you, when you talk about, say, databases, you know, databases are very attractive for parts of the problem that you identified. Say, if you want to ask your question about what are the genes associated with MI, what's the current best view, you know, it'd be nice to calculate our best answer, not, not to have to go look at, you know, 10 different papers published, you know, two or three years apart and try and digest. And, that, and none of those would be the best answer, because the best answer would be taking the data together from all of them. Uh, but, you know, th there's other things where I, I, I think th the idea of having a, a large database to, and think that it will solve our problem sounds actually quite scary to me. You know, if you, if you think about, say, processing sequence data, you know, and saying, you know, we, we need to figure out a way to put the sequence data in one place and analyze it once with some set of, I, mm -hmm. I think those are the kind of problems, you know, it's, it's more of a compute problem than a database problem. It's a problem that rapidly becomes obsolete, you know, so you're, you're going to build some white elephant and it's, and, and two, two or three years from now you're going to have to build it again, right? So, so, so I, I, I think that there, you know, if, if you take Carlos approach, you know, how do I make the data easily available? That's, the, the, the data easily available solution lasts for a long time. You know, the, the single compute place could be easily a white elephant. It could cost you more than. Yeah. So I, I think that, the, let's the put it so I, I'm not surprised to hear you say that. And um, <laughs> I think that that's one of the reasons you'll note on my slide, innovation and diversity. Because I think that if you want to avoid a white elephant on the one hand, certainly one way to ensure you have a white elephant is to have one of them. Because then you'll have lowest common denominator, committee-driven process, and it'll be, and you would like competition among these things. However, I'm going to make, I'm going to respond in kind by saying that even in the, in the environment I work in, which has a large, uh, a high proportion of, of really great analysts who can do things, it's still the case that often there's someone in the next room over who doesn't have the access to the answer. Actually, someone in our group meeting yesterday, because we were talking a little bit about this, and someone in our group meeting made it, who's a very sophisticated person computationally said, I don't understand why this is a problem. You just go grep this file, and then you go do this, and you do that, and you get the answer. And even if that person knows that, even if it happens to be true, and this was not a go back to the raw data thing, this was sort of some you know, available data, even if she knows that, 
It's not clear that anyone else in our group meeting knows that, let alone anyone outside of our group would have access to the answer. So I agree with you, Gonzalo. We don't want, I totally agree that we do not want to create a white elephant, one size fits all thing that's out of date immediately. That would just mean we did a really bad job and we were wasting the money and we shouldn't do it. At the other hand, the fact that individual analysts have access to data and can write their papers does not solve the, other th the problem of the other three oh, communities. I, 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 yeah. Like yeah. Okay, the other problem that I have is, you know, I think part of this is, you know, how do we address the data we have now? The, the data we, we have now is only a fraction of the data we're going to have in the future. And so I think it's, it's also important for some of these questions. If, if we can sit here and Adam can go and say, you know, here are things that I think are high value. You know, we have ability to contact participants or there's few restrictions on use. You know, it'd be nice to have a model consent, for example, that, that mm -hmm. means that, you know, when we yeah. have this meeting five years from now or 10 years from now, at least some of us might still be working in this field by then. You know, maybe you'll f found new fields as you, but, uh, you know, we, we, we don't rehash these yeah. questions. And so yeah. it, it, I think it's important to have to think about what's the ideal consent and right. can we can we use it more broad or or, uh, or the equivalent of, of you know sort of um, standards right saying okay consents that meet these set of standards right. will then be allowed going forward right. in the way you said I think I think, the same, standard I think in the same way Gonzalo that you're you're correctly pointing out and I do totally agree with you we should not have a solution we want competition between different things and we also don't want a consent because there's going to be one consent that'll be for free data sharing and it'll be a very good thing, but only of somewhat, you know, only some set of people will sign up and we have different things. Uh, Chris O'Donnell was waiting earlier. Did you want to? Okay, sorry. Chris O'Donnell. Yeah. Uh, hi, David. Um, two comments. One is um, to amplify on the, the question of, of communities that we should, that you should be on your list. I think the populations providing the studies, the actual participants in those, in those yeah. populations yeah. is very important. I mean, because by engaging them, I think you have an opportunity to get buy-in by those those populations. So I think that's going to be yeah. terribly important. The other part is, is you mentioned uh, the HDL study, and um, one thing that that I'm worried about is that through all the thinking on on how to get the data together and knit it together, that the actual end product of the results of the analyses would just be put in a shoebox. It would be a really big shoebox, but it would be potentially a shoebox. The only thing that would come out is the low-hanging fruit. Mm -hmm. And like many of these GWAS that we are all involved in, some of those data are shared publicly, and in many cases, they're not. And it would be really, I think, a good thing to think about how to make the data very widely available so a lookup could be performed and, and the effort would be maximized. Yeah. All right. So I think, unfortunately, it's up to you what you want to do. 